Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. <coughs> and thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, the organizers for, for inviting me to give this talk on, on a <coughs> topic that is exciting and dynamic. In the recent decade, there's been a surge of high quality research <coughs> in the different aspects of fluid resuscitation. Partly from our group uh, across the Öresund in Copenhagen. <coughs> and uh, so we've learning a lot over the time. However, uh, as Anders pointed out and Robert pointed out, there are <coughs> points of controversies. Uh, and one of those controversies are the colloid versus crystalloid debate. The title of my talk, Is There a Place for Colloids in the Resuscitation of Critical Ill? So, and the purpose of the talk is to review some aspects of, <coughs> of, of, um, uh, of resusc resuscitation with colloids and provide you with my take on, 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 on the current level of knowledge. So, given that it's a, it's a huge subject, uh, I can't cover all aspects of it, so I'll, I'll focus on the points that I am particularly interested in. And, Together with uh, the, the things that Anders and Robert took up earlier, I hope there's a, uh, we'll, we'll have a great discussion at, at the end of the talk. So, and for the purpose of this lecture, by critically ill patients, I mainly refer to, to septic patients in the ICU, so there won't be much of, of, of uh, anesthe anesthesiology or anesthesia in this talk. So, is this a new debate, or is it old? Well. <coughs> As it turns out, uh, the earliest uh, evidence of this debate is from, from almost 100 years ago, now when Walter B. Cannon summarized his experiences from, from taking care of injured patients in, in, in the First World War. And uh, on the injection of salt solutions, he said that all the evidence, both clinical and experimental, indicates that intravenous injection of warm, normal saline or ringer solutions has only a temporary effect. The injected fluid will promptly pass from the capillaries into the tissue spaces, and within a brief period, the pressure is as low as before. And he then so, and then he goes on to 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 mention uh, the alternative then, which is at that time was called gum salt solution, which is colloids. Uh, salt solution fail to produce a permanent rise in blood pressure because they lack a colloid material, <coughs> which, like the protein in blood of plasma, uh, prevents uh, water from passing through. Various colloids have been suggested to compensate for this lack, among them boiled starch, agar, dextrin, gelatin, and gum acacia. So already in, at that time, and he then goes on to uh, discuss uh, potential beneficial effects of, of colloids. So already at that time, Cannon quite nicely summarized the issue that we have at hand here. So basically what it's all about is that colloids, at least according to Cannon, have a low potency as plasma volume expanders and are prone to cause excess interstitial fluid accumulation, whereas colloids are believed to have a higher potency as plasma volume expanders and therefore less prone to cause interstitial fluid accumulation. So is this a relevant question today? What, how many of us use colloids and how many of us uh, use crystalloids in resuscitation? Well, as Anders alluded to, there's been recent glo global surveys about uh, practices with regards to uh, resuscitation in critically ill patients. So this is a survey conducted in 2014 and that was recently published in, in PLOS, uh, showing that at, at this point in time across the world, we most, mostly use crystalloids, about 70% of all fluid boluses in ICUs uh, are performed using crystalloids, and about 30% of the resuscitation are performed using colloids. And, and with regards to the type of, of colloids used at present, uh, the absolute majority of us use um, uh, albumin, and there's very little use of HES and, and gelatin. One has to point out that 
this is the global average for, for the, 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 the centers that participated in this study, but it varies a lot from country to country. So, for example, in Denmark, only 10% of all fluid resuscitations are performed using colloids, whereas in Australia, the numbers are more like 50-50. So, how does these, um, this practice correspond to current guidelines? <coughs> well, uh, in an excellent review published uh, 2015 in, uh, in ACTA, um, um, called the Scandinavian uh, Clinical Practice Guidelines, um, the recommendation for sepsis, sepsis treatment is that for, for general ICU patients and those with sepsis, we recommend using crystalloids for resuscitation rather than starches, and we suggest using crystalloids rather than gelatin and, and, and uh, albumin. And just to make one thing short, suggest is weaker than recommend and thus indicate uncertainties with regards to the evidence concerning, for example, bias and biases with regards to cost effectiveness. Uh, so what does the surviving sepsis guideline say then with regards to, <coughs> to the evidence, current evidence? Well, the surviving sepsis campaign have a slightly different take on, on, on the current evidence. And they say that they actually suggest using albumin in addition to crystalloids for initial resuscitation of, of, um, of septic patients that, that remain hemodynamically unstable. So that's kind of a different take on, on, on the evidence, current evidence. And, and I think that reflects the really frail evidence base that we're working with. So let's go back to the Scandinavian um, guidelines. So with regards to sepsis, the, the Scandinavian guidelines are based mainly on two, the two landmark studies, really, the, the Albius and, and the SAFE, SAFE study. And as you can see from this forest plot, uh, it's, it's actually very close for, for a, a beneficial effect of, of albumin in, in these two trials. But it, it didn't reach the, the uh, stati statistical significance. So although I, I, I'm pretty sure that you're familiar with these studies, I'll just walk you through them briefly and, and point out a couple of things that I think is important uh, for, for this debate. And so I'll start with the Albius trial. So the Albius trial was an Italian trial, included about 1,800 septic patients, <coughs> uh, and they were resuscitated with 20% albumin to reach a target of 30 grams per liter of plasma albumin for the duration of their stay in the ICU. Uh, the primary outcome was 90-day survival, and there was no uh, difference uh, between the intervention group and the control group with regards to that. However, vasopressors were weaned slightly earlier in, in the intervention group, and MAPs and CVPs were higher in the intervention group, than, uh, and uh, heart rate was lower in the intervention group. There was no difference in, in the total amount of fluid given uh, however, the cumulative fluid balance at seven days was slightly lower in the group given, given albumin. So, uh, <coughs> with regard to the Albius study, yet one has to re uh, remember that it was not really designed to, to answer the question whether, whether, we can, whether albumin is beneficial compared to crystalloid as a resuscitation fluid. It was, in the Albio study, albumin was used more like a drug to maintain a plasma level. So it wasn't actually targeted towards uh, hemodynamic goals at all. Never, nevertheless, the study supported the concept that albumin has some, some potential to improve preload or a potential to improve preload and, and more, perhaps most importantly, reduce flu fluid overload in sepsis. So, that leaves us with, with a SAFE study, which is actually the only study so far that has compared albumin to crystalloids as a resuscitation fluid. Um, so the SAFE study was, it's quite old now, it's actually from 2001 to 2003, was published in 2004, so it's getting pretty old, but anyways, 7,000 patients uh, uh, 1,200 of these uh, suffered from, from sepsis. And I'd like, you to, I'd like to emphasize that treatment with resuscitation fluids in this study was 
determined by the clinician, whom determine the amount and <clears throat> rate of fluid administration according to each patient's clinical status and response to treatment. So that was the hemodynamic or, uh, resuscitation algorithm that was governing the, the administration of resuscitation fluid in, in the SAFE study. Uh, as you know, there was no difference in 28-day mortality. For sepsis patients, there was a signal for benefit, but that wasn't uh, significant. About 100 milliliters less fluid was administered the first three days of admission in the albumin group. Uh, heart rate was lower, CVP higher in the albumin group. So, my take on, on that is that uh, despite the patient's the fact that the, the albumin group received less fluid, they actually achieved similar, at least similar increases in preload. What was surprising with, with uh, the SAFE trial was that the ratio of, of albumin to crystalloids was 1 to 1.4. So, so it almost looked like albumin and crystalloids were equally, equally potent in, in, in a cl clinical setting. And that kind of challenged the dogma that we've all, all, all learned that, that albumin is perhaps four to five times as potent as a, as a plasma volume expander as, as crystalloids. So, so why would that be? Uh, well, the, the, the superior potency of, of albumin as, as a plasma volume expander is actually thought to, to be dependent on, on the low permeability for, for albumin through the microvascular wall. And, and as you all know, in critically ill patients, we think that permeability is increased. So could it be that, that the increased permeability in the critically ill actually results in, 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 in a situation where albumin is actually very, very, has a low very low efficacy as a plasma volume expander. And what do we know about that? Well, there's very little data, as I think um, Robert pointed out, on, on, on plasma volume expansion in, in, in patients, especially in, in sick patients. However, there was a group in, or there is a group in, in Vancouver that studied this question in, in a couple of papers published uh, in 99 and, and 2000 in CCM. So what they did was that they, <coughs> they uh, gave sepsis patients or post-operative cardiothoracic patients uh, normal saline or 5% or albumin um, with the goal to increase pulmonary artery pressure to 50 millimeters of mercury. Uh, in order to limit vasopressor and inotropic support. And then they measured plasma volume expansion immediately after finishing the, the infusion of, of albumin and, and uh, uh, saline. Uh, in sepsis, <coughs> uh, in the septic patients, or in the septic pa uh, paper, about 21% of the crystalloids uh, were left in the circulation immediately after infusion, whereas for albumin, uh, the, the fraction of, 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 uh, of uh, fluid remaining in the circulation was actually uh, higher than what had been infused. So, so that gave them a, a ratio of 1 to 5 in the septic patients. For the post-operative um, uh, cardiothoracic patients who had been on, 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 uh, on uh, bypass, uh, which is kind of a model for systemic inflammatory response, uh, uh, absolute plasma volume expansion by crystalloids and, and, and albumin was actually lower, but the ratio between the two were the same, so it's one to five. So that kind of fits with our, our model of, of, of how, how um, uh, crystalloids and, and albumin behaves. So could it be that, well, this is immediate data, and, and, and of course uh, albumin leaks out of the circulation, and, and so does crystalloids. So could it be that there is a difference in the long term, because in, in clinical practice, we're, we're interested in hours and days and weeks and not in immediately, immediate plasma volume expansion. So, and there's virtually no data available on that, apart from one study which was published in BGA in uh, uh, 2004 by Marguson and Sony, where they, where they infused 20% uh, uh, albumin, 200 milliliters, and then measured plasma volume change uh, by measuring changes in, in hematocrits. And uh, what they found was that uh, 
albumin, 20% albumin expanded plasma, if you convert that into 5% albumin, uh, uh, you, you, you can see that plasma volume expansion was about 50% of, of the infused volume. They didn't have a, a crystalloid uh, control group, so we don't know what, what, what that would be. Uh, and there's no human data on that. However, our group for a, cou a couple of years ago did, did the following experiment. Um, so we, we exposed uh, quite a few rats to abdominal sepsis or hemorrhage and then resuscitated them with 5% albumin ring, uh, ring acetate and then looked at plasma volume expansion four hours after, after the resuscitation. So in the sepsis group, which, which we know have increased permeability and they are hypovolemic, uh, the ratio of, of, of crystalloids to albumin was 1 to 10. So if anything, albumin is actually a more potent plasma volume expander in, in this model of, of sepsis. And uh, uh, following hemorrhage, uh, the ratio was the expected 1 to 5. So where did that, where did that leave, so, leave us? Well, on one hand, we have physiologic evidence saying that uh, Albumin is actually a more potent plasma volume expander than, than crystalloid. On the other hand, we have clinical data suggesting that it doesn't appear to be any difference between the two. So how do we reconcile these, uh, these two, two, two facts? Well, I think the answer is related to how we administer fluid as clinicians in clinical practice. In a recently published survey by Ciccone, the Fenice study, which was published uh, a couple of years ago, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the authors surveyed indication for fluid boluses across the world. And as in the First World War, hypertension is still the, the main indication for giving fluids in, in, in intensive care, followed by oliguria, uh, need to wean vasopressors, high lactate, uh, low cardiac output, and skin mottling. And in 80% of the patients, no attempt was made to try to predict whether this was a responder or not. What about response, then, to the fluids that was a Britain? Remember, we give fluid boluses because it's easier to determine a response than giving it uh, uh, slowly. So, perhaps not surprisingly, response was... Uh, <coughs> was actually uh, determined by looking at the same indications for, for giving fluid. But what is surprising is that no matter what the response was, the patient was equally likely to get more fluid. So, so that's a pretty sorry state of affairs, isn't it? Uh, and how many of those patients are likely to be responders then? And by responder, I mean uh, an increase in cardiac output after administration of fluid. Well, about 50, only 50% 50 of the patients that receive fluid on these indications are responders. In the remaining 50% of, of the patients, fluid will be ineffective no matter how, what the potency of that fluid is. So what's the implication for, for, for the safe, uh, safe study results? Well, in studies in which clinical signs and symptoms are used as indications for fluid administration, a difference in efficacy can only be, be expected in about 50% of the patients. So, the implications for future studies on colloids is that by predicting fluid responsiveness, we can identify patients that are likely to benefit from any difference in potency between crystalloids and colloids. These are the patients that can benefit from a difference in efficacy. So, uh, what about subgroups? Well, there's this subgroups. The patients with septic shock. <clears throat> I think, uh, and the, the patients with septic shock, they're actually defined by an absence in response to, to, to crystalloids. So, it kind of makes sense that this would be the, the group to look at if we want to look at differences in, in efficacy of, of uh, colloids versus crystalloids, especially if we think that, that what we want to gain by, by giving colloids is to reduce fluid overload. This is, the, the, this is a group of patients where we have the potential to, to make the most difference. Uh, 
This is a group of patients who, who actually get in the VAS study did eight, 18 liters during the first three days success, 11 liters during the first uh, uh, three days, and classic 13 liters during the first days. Is there any evidence to suggest that this sub subgroup would benefit from administration of, of albumin uh, instead of, of colloids? Well, there was a subgroup analysis of, of the Albius trial which showed a, a significant effect. That subgroup wasn't pre-specified, so we really don't know, but at least it's a signal that in this specific subgroup there might be a benefit of, of, of uh, colloids versus crystalloids. Again, the Albius wasn't designed to, to really evaluate the albumin versus crystalloids as resuscitation foods. Um, albumin is expensive, uh, very expensive. It's about 40 times more expensive than, uh, than crystalloids, so there's an economic issue, and, and hence the interest in, in synthetic alternatives. So thanks to, to the work of, of, of Anders and colleagues, uh, we now know that the starches is, is probably not good to give uh, sepsis patients. Uh, in Scandinavia, however, we have a tradition of, of using a lot of dextran, as, as Anders, uh, Anders mentioned. And, and a couple of years ago, there was a publication of a couple of studies uh, suggesting that dextran is associated with, with, with harm uh, with re regards to AKI, increased bleeding episodes, and so on. And, and since we in, in Lund, where I used to work, have used a lot of dextran in, in, um, through the years, we, we felt obliged to try to evaluate if, if dextran uh, had, had harmed our patients. So we, we then did this study. This is uh, recently published. Uh, effect of dextran on outcome in severe sepsis propensity, uh, propensity score matching study. So it's pretty hard to see, but we, we screened all our patients between 2007 up to 2016 for, with the diagnosis of sepsis. And after exclusion of patients that had re uh, uh, received starches, <coughs> we ended up with about 780 patients who had received, uh, with, with a diagnosis of severe sepsis or sepsis, and we then uh, propensity matched patients who had received dextran to those who had not received dextran. So in essence, we ended up with a group that had received crystalloids, albumin, and dextran, and compared that to a, a control group that had only received albumin and crystalloids. Um, We've, the cumulative dose of, dose of, of dextran was about seven milliliters, 17 milliliters per, per kilo, so that's within like the recommended range. Uh, we found that less albumin was used in the dextran group, so that kind of supports the, 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 the concept of using a synthetic uh, uh, colloid to reduce albumin use. Uh, however, more packed red cells were used in, in the dextran group. Fluid balance was surprisingly more positive uh, in, in the dextran group, uh, even though we had a very good match using the propensity score matching. We, we matched on like 26 parameters, and, and uh, so we think it was very, very well matched. With regards to the main outcomes, there was a signal for, uh, for an increase in AKI, but it, it, it didn't reach statistical significance. Uh, and, and perhaps more importantly, uh, renal replacement therapy incidence or duration wasn't affected by, by dextran treatment. There was a, a weak signal for, for a benefit in mortality in 108 days. Uh, whether this is chance finding, finding, we don't know, but we can at least conclude that it doesn't appear that we've, we've done any harm in, in those years using dextran at these doses. Um, okay, so... The conclusions. Future trials should use a well-defined resuscitation protocol, perhaps using a prediction of fluid responsiveness. And what I mean by future trials is future trials trying to, to discern the role of crystalloids versus colloids. Future trials should also be directed, or at least plan ahead for analysis of, of, of subpopulation of patients that are more likely to benefit from, from a superior efficacy of colloids as, as plasma volume expanders. And, and by that, I mean septic shock primarily. And that study has surprisingly not been done yet. Um, 
And there's also a, a need for high quality data to define the role of, of dextran in, in the resuscitation of sepsis, if there is a role at all. And maybe we shouldn't throw out the baby with the, with the water, meaning that just because one synthetic colloid is, is bad, it doesn't necessarily mean that all synthetic colloids are, are, are bad. And there are resource poor settings in the world where, where albumin is not available. Okay, uh, just would like to thank former and current group members that have con contributed to this work, uh, collaborators in Vancouver and, and in Lund University. That's all. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> um, so we had three speakers who gave us all sorts of questions and the answer every time was we need more trials and I don't think you actually have any answers at all. I wonder whether, um, it, it, obviously Anders right now wants to address fluid restriction after the boss. What's the next question that needs to be asked? Is it... Do we still need to do another colloid trial, or who who is who's the subgroup in well, whom in whom you want to test albumin? I, I I think that if we all or well, uh, uh, there is accumulating evidence that fluid overload is is, is probably bad. I mean, it, by definition, fluid overload should be bad. Otherwise, it should be fluid load. Uh, so, so if, if, if we introduce albumin as a player or colloids as a player to reduce fluid overload uh, and, and the role has to be defined if there is a role for, for colloids. Uh, so uh, I think that's probably the, so it's uh, probably two trials at least. Uh, I think there is a need for a colloid versus a crystalloid uh, trial but it has to be done in, in the setting of, of fluid restriction. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, very interesting study you had on dextrain. Uh, you obviously have found a, a way of using dextrain uh, which uh, is of benefit to the patients. Uh, really good. Uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, it's uh, another synthetic colloid, um, starch, um, is, is found to be in the perioperative setting to be of uh, uh, no harm to the patient whatsoever as long as we respect the contraindications. If you use it wisely, not uh, overhydrate the patient, you don't give it to patients who are dehydrated, you don't give it to patients who are, have a renal dysfunction, and you don't give it, give it for 90 days on end. There seems to be no problem with starch. And uh, could, do you have any thoughts why why it's the same species, I mean, you should have the same ability to use starch in the ICU as long as you use it in the right way. Uh, well, I, th I think that uh, at present it's a non-issue in, 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 in intensive care, given the results of the chest and, and the success trial. So, so and, and the reason why I was surprised actually in Lund that we had used starches at all uh, because I think that starches are probably in the OR it might be beneficial I don't know I, I don't know the the OR literature that well uh, but in the OR we are talking about hours uh, so the the pretty poor plasma volume expanding properties of or the the the, the short duration of plasma volume expansion by by starches is perhaps okay in the OR because then we wake them up and, and so forth and so forth. But in, in, the, in the critically ill patients, uh, we, we're talking about days and weeks uh, and then uh, it's a key factor that what we give the patient to stay where we, we want them, want it to stay. So I think that's probably uh, uh, the best answer I, I can give you. The, the, uh, there might be controversy over whether starch is safe in the OR. Uh, Anders, you have a question, comment? We have a microphone here. It's more of a warning, I guess. Uh, so no randomized control trial 
has shown benefits of choroids in any subgroup of patients. Um, clear indications of harms in some subgroups of patients with starch. The point estimate in the Cochrane meter analysis is worse for dextrin than for any of the other choroids. So, so before we pronounce that they are safe, I think a more balanced uh, conclusion would be that if you want to continue these drugs, please do a randomized control trial with high quality, long follow-up, patient important outcome measures showing the benefit of any of these um, drugs. Thanks. Um, so we, <laughs> I'm slightly nervous about uh, telling you the question we have here from the audience. <laughs> but in the interest of open disclosure, we will say it out loud. It's, it's a little bit similar, I think, to some of the comments I made at the beginning. Someone asks, why does the fluid debate never approach a conclusion? <laughs> and I'm sort of sad that someone asked it, but of course they asked it. So, um, so actually to any of our three speakers, um, maybe just uh, uh, sort of 15 seconds each, uh, just your take on uh, why we're never getting to an answer. Are we actually making progress and we're just uncovering more sophisticated questions or are we just spinning our wheels? Peter, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, I, I, I can start out. I, I think we are making progress, uh, and I, I, but, uh, because at least our patients are s seemingly doing better o over time. But we, and that's all, I mean, all our treatments, so whether it's fluid management that is improving or, or but, but survival in, for example, sep sepsis has, has, has improved in, in, uh, in the latest years. So I think overall we're doing good. We're, we, we're not sure what we're doing better, but we are doing better. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure it's a bad sign that we keep on debating this, because, I mean, we're, for hopefully we're debating it on, on a higher level all the time. Yeah. Hello, I'm out. Yeah, yeah uh, I would like to say that I think that our flu therapy has improved immensely during um, the perioperative period in the past 20 years. It's a really been a specification of how much should we give. We have learned the adverse effects, we have learned harm, we have learned when we give too little, uh, and it's a lot better. I, I think it uh, uh, should be recognized. And I'm very happy that we have so much development now in intensive care where the uh, situation is much more complex than it is in a perioperative setting. I think the... But, but the just before you say anything, Robert ended on a really positive yeah. note. <laughs> I will be very positive. Excellent. <laughs> so we have learned that these are drugs. That's very important. They have effects. Uh, we should focus enormously to identify the patients that will likely benefit. I totally agree. Don't expect miracles. This is probably a pretty poor intervention overall. So, so be a bit conservative and watch out for side effects in the specific patients. If you take that home with you, I, I think uh, that's a reasonable lesson for um, today. Okay. Well, on that note, I just uh, would ask you all to join with Anders and myself in thanking again the three speakers. <laughs>